Born is the what of Israel? The king. Well, we spend a lot of time all year long talking about these funny words that the Bible has for God and Jesus. And, you know, we quarrel with the masculinity of it. Uh, and we quarrel with the uh, kind of quaintness of it. I mean, we don't have kings anymore, do we? <laughs> no, we, seriously, we don't have kings anymore. I mean, we got wannabes. Uh, we have enough bad government to give a preacher a field day if you want to go that way. But you know, it's Christmas. And as I said, we have a one-on-one -on -one correspondence with today's reality and this text. And that really is a problem because you all are pretty smart and you know that what that means is that things are not getting better. They're almost staying in the same pattern of bad governments that create borders that keep people out and keep people moving and keep people under their thumb. And what I want to talk about today is that the hope for Christmas means the hope for good government. That's what it means. It means a good king, not a mean king. It means people who can self-govern and who have a chance to participate in their own governance that don't have to be forced out of their homes or forced to places that aren't their homes. The hope we have in Jesus is a hope for good government. Now, I want to obviously make lots of time for Micah to tell us about the border. He'll do that during Joys and Concerns, which is the appropriate time to do it. But I want to set up a problem of this continuity of difficult government and then give us some chance at restoring ourselves. There's a great uh, lecture from Yale Divinity School right now done by a man named Charles Campbell who is a teacher of preaching. And he says, look, every preacher, the real fear being a preacher is somebody's going to say, all right, where was the good news in all that? And you're going to say, oh, I couldn't find it. Oh. And Campbell actually argues that it's not about the good news so much as it is about the restoration, that the problem is articulated and then there is a restoration to the problem and that good preachers are like crime novelists and are looking to find out who did it <laughs> and making sure that some of the people in the audience know that some of them did it too without overly judging them. And he says it's not about getting the good news so much as restoration, the scratch for the itch. I like that phrase. But moreover, that we restore order Order has broken down. Even the government part of it's not working right now. So order has broken down. And to restore order is to bring the good news of Campbell's word, pattern. If we could just have pattern again, we would know how to wait on the border. We would know what to do next. So I'm going to suggest a pattern. And the pattern is good government is the answer to bad government. Good government is the answer to bad government. And I couldn't believe that the US Census delivered its, um, its letter to me today. Did any of you get it this weekend also? There it was in yesterday's mail with a big sign on the front of the envelope saying, you must fill this out. It is a law. And I thought, well, OK. Does that mean I have to fill it out accurately or could I claim lots of other people in my household? But the census is not bad government, right? It can be abused by people, but it's a form of good government. When you meet a man on the train, as we did uh, 
upstate on Friday night who was clearly out of his mind on opioids. What do you do? You call for some good government or some people who know how to help him, how to deliver something to him. It could happen to any of us that we would need the help of good government. So the problem for us, and much more the problem for the oppressed poor, is improving and hoping to improve the government. So the gospel does declare hope in good government. Jesus Christ is king, lord of lords, on top of everything else. And good government allows people to stay at home and doesn't force them out of their homes. So what would good government do about the border and refugee crisis? We would surely say that some borders are good while acknowledging how many people are literally being driven out of them, out of their own country, having to cross borders. Myanmar, Syria, Mexico, Guatemala, could keep naming them. More countries have refugees than I could even remember. There's a lot of people who forgot to make a reservation in the middle class. A lot of people who forgot to be born in a relatively decent place. And the problem for them is they are even being forced out of where they were born. So when the new sanctuary movement started banding about banding about the phrase abolish ICE, the good pragmatic liberal in me started to scold. Sounds dumb. Makes you look stupid. Like people who believe in the announcements of angels to map their journeys. Sounds innocent about the workings of government, even though I should have known that government willy-nilly demands the registration for the people, all times, all places. We could also think about our language, I would say. Why abolish it? People don't abolish government agencies. Oh, whoops, the EPA. Oh my. Hmm. How do you abolish a government agency? You underfund it. You ignore it. You put its regulations aside. So I lost that argument. I've been quarreling, as I said, with Ravi, our executive director, about this matter for way too long. On Friday, he decided to give me a long speech and a new argument for why to limit the power <clears throat> of this new version of the governor, Quirinius. He said the best thing we could do for American-based immigrants would be to support the legalization of marijuana. I was perplexed. <clears throat> And then he continued, then you reduce the number of convictions and they won't have any, so many legal reasons to deport you. And then he continued some more. And then you empty the jails of some of the people serving time for breaking the laws that were stupid in the first place. Not to mention the excitement with which those same laws target people of color. I can't tell you the number of white friends I have who've gotten off of drug raps. It's amazing, really. I can't tell you the number of black people who didn't. So what is the final answer around abolishing ICE? You could decide to go another direction as a good government. Imagine Guatemala drowning in all the money that would go to build a wall, or Mexico, or Honduras, agriculture restored solar power maximized, artists employed, children educated, domestic violence eradicated, men and women and people of all genders living together without hurting each other, hospitals funded. That would take about the first 10% of what the wall might cost. 
rebuilding economies south of the border would allow people to stay home where they want to be in the first place. Restoring order for people. Now, and we've all long noted that Christians don't really care about walls or borders, and we've also long noted that Christians live in nation states under different kinds of governors who love borders. So why not make borders less consequential and more permeable under different kinds of governors who understand that people want to stay home and people want to move? What's the problem with that? It actually creates hybridity. It creates economies. It creates fun. It creates intermarriages. It's really an interesting idea for a good government. And by the way, I am told that the best investment you can make today is in marijuana-based products. So imagine another economy not a wall. And, you know, I don't really hope to abolish ICE, but I wouldn't mind it having a much smaller budget, would you? Because I hope for people to have inns wherever they are. So, if you were to do that, you would have to have a different government. Jesus Christ would have to be Lord so thus ends the practical and political part of this sermon. If I may, I'd like to talk about something I know something about as opposed to immigration policy. I know about calm, and I know about worry, and I know what good government can do for our capacity to be calm and to worry less. See, right now there's an enormous gap between the people I worry about, who are the people I know, and the people I don't know how to worry about because I don't know them, but I worry anyway. But I worry in this impassive way, like there's nothing I can do about it. So when Micah decided to go to the border, our entire staff uh, started talking about outfitting him with a GPS system. <laughs> and. We just didn't want anything to happen to you. Isn't that weird? We know him, right? We love him. But there are thousands of people we don't know. And we don't know how to know. And we don't know how to care for them, except by the capacities of good government. So. I'm not saying it was bad for us to worry about you, but it was small of us. It was small of us. Walter Brueggemann said this morning on the Krista Tippett show that the Protestantism has thrown itself into a complete tizzy about the so-called gay issue. And he said, you know, it's not really about the gay issue at all. And I thought, you know, that's true. It's really not about the gay issue. It's about fear of the other, the other that you don't know. It's about that, and that is our subject. If we can become spiritually mature enough to care about people we don't know, as well as people we do know, then there is a possibility that we can be a force for a good government. The new book out called Worried, Science investigates some of life's common concerns. The two authors examine a host of common sources of worry, food, medicines, the environment, chemicals, travel, terrorism, the economy. And for each topic, like good scientists, they evaluate the dangers, predictability. There are four categories, okay? Don't worry, unlikely and preventable. Don't worry, unpreventable, but unlikely. A fatalistic, don't worry, likely, but unpreventable, so who cares? And an unequivocal, worry about this. And they give us five things we should worry about. The environment uh, and driving and the fact that we don't have a government solution to what to do about cars. 
uh, acetaminophen, taking too much, does something to your brain or something, oral contraception, Ebola, no, and a little bit under those are fluoride, your diet, and the fact that you might be addicted to computer games. So that's what you can worry about. So under that, I think we can also worry about self-governance, about becoming people whose pattern is to hope for the good, about becoming people who see in this story, this ancient, ancient story, in which we're here today singing these songs, we have made a reservation to be booked in this story. We can live there and hope in good government while self-governing to the best of our ability. And by the way, that means not worrying so much. Amen. <laughs>